What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the NS Builders Podcast. I'm Nick Schiffer, and in front of me, I have my pre-construction agreement. You lovely people on YouTube say that I promise you things and I don't deliver. Well, I'm going to deliver it today. Um, so the reason I was holding off on sharing it just yet, let me dig into that first and then we'll talk about what's on this, is the legality of it. Um, you know, I had sent this to my lawyer. We went through this, made sure that I was legally protected as to what I was offering in my services. And I don't know how that plays out in different states, never mind different countries uh, that might be taking this from me and then just running, running with it. Um, I don't want to mislead someone down the, you know, an incorrect path. Um, and have someone say, well, you know, Nick from NS Builders on, on YouTube gave this to me, um, which I don't think would actually be the case, but I wanted to make sure we were protected. So we're working through that. Um, we do want to kind of clean this up and be able to offer it as a document. But for those that are so eager to know, we're going to walk through it uh, today in just a minute. I also uh, wanted to be sure that I wasn't giving you something that I, uh, for lack of better terms, plagiarized, because I think Oftentimes in business, what we do is we research and find examples of what we want to be um, using for documentation. Uh, and that's exactly what I did here. I actually Googled um, pre-construction agreements and I had researched probably a handful of them. And I, what I did is right before this podcast, I actually popped on Google and copy and pasted some of my words or some of these, uh, these um, sections that I had broken out and dumped them into Google to, to then understand like, did I copy this? Did I modify it? Where where did it come from? And it did. It came from a Google document I found. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't find who it was tied to as a builder, so I can't give them um, a reference, but it was something I took from Google and then modified to make work for me, and then I kicked it to my lawyer. So again, not legal advice, but I do recommend talking to a lawyer. Um, I also know that some of you guys have commented saying that the... Um, AIA, that's what I was looking for. AIA, I believe, has some pre preliminary and pre-construction agreements uh, within their um, kind of catalog. Uh, they're actually a contract that we're looking to implement here. Some more robust cost plus contracts and some more robust fixed cost contracts. Our contract is great. It really actually started out as a Massachusetts home improvement contract, uh, which is required in Massachusetts. You have you have to be required with the HIC, which is a home improvement contractor. Um, and when you're doing a renovation, you actually have to use their contract. And it's, you know, uh, I'm sure m many of you might know, but if you don't, it's like down to the, the font type, the size, what's highlighted, what's not, all of this stuff. And it walks through kind of you know uh, the project but as we get into bigger projects we want a more robust contract so we're looking at the AIA ones we'll probably talk about that in a future episode all right let's talk about the our pre-construction retainer so basically working my way down I'm just gonna read it to you guys you guys don't get to see this just yet like I said I'm gonna share it when when it, the time is right uh, we have homeowner and contractor information up top um, I always include who sold the job in my case it's all it's always me um, and you know Basically, uh, we're going to get right into what the agreement says. Pre-construction retainer agreement. A pre-construction service is to be provided by the contractor. It's going to include, but not limited to, cost estimating, value engineering, scheduling, construction phasing, constructability review, weekly design review with the meetings with the owner, input from key subcontractors as to the building systems, means and methods of construction. That is the summary of it. What does that all mean? So basically, it's it's offering up what we are, you know, accessible for. What are our deliverables? And you know, the the key here is, I think, the input from subcontractors. And why I think this is so important is that if we don't have a pre-construction agreement in place, I'm rarely, excuse me, I'm rarely going to be calling a, my plumber and saying, "Hey, can you look at this job and get me a price on it." And because I'm wasting their time. It's not even our job yet. It's so it's so preliminary. Instead, I'm going to go back and look at past projects. Or maybe I don't have a project that, you know, maybe it's a, a bigger house or maybe it's a past project or uh, we don't have any past projects that meet that. And in that case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at, you know, let's find a project that is similar. You know, maybe they've done, you know, this that project had a kitchen and a bathroom, but you know, this house has a kitchen and four bathrooms. Well, I'm going to take that and try to break it down like plumbing. I t tr typically try to break it down by fixture to get me a, a rough idea where it's like, you know, a sink has, you know, a sink is considered one fixture, even though it's faucet and sink, but usually it's like one 
one plumbing. You know, you have water, you have drain, uh, and a vent. So trying to break it down like that and look at look towards, um, you know, some preliminary pricing. But when we have a pre-construction agreement in place, I can then go back and say, hey, this is a real job for us. We're we're brought in to actually put some real pricing together. You know, I want you to be the plumber on the job when we proceed with construction. Um, it's really our job to lose at that point because we're not to to be you know. To be clear, a pre-construction agreement does not mean we're building the project. It means that they've hired us to work through pre-construction through the deliverables I just mentioned. But I can go back to the plumber, my plumber, and say, this is a real job. Can you take a look at it? Here's the scope. We're looking to really hone in the pricing to, to nail down. Because the goal with all of this is to, you know, as design is being developed, we're developing the budget. And when design hopefully gets to 100%, you know, where everything has been selected and, and, and drawn, then we're able to price that and be really, really accurate with our, our pricing. And whether that's a fixed cost contract, meaning like we're set in the price, or if it's a cost plus contract, it's almost this hybrid where it's like we've priced everything, so there's very little exposure. Our contract might be written as cost plus to protect us if there's, you know, varying, you know, material prices as we are experiencing. But re the reality is we've done our due diligence and the project really should cost this much. And maybe we have a 10% uh, buffer on that um you know just just for incidentals or things that we might have overlooked or had exposure on um it goes on to speak more specifically and i'm, I'm going to read down there's two sections provide scheduling and estimating services and provide constructability review with bid documents and the review will help verify and help identify any problems in the following areas and uh, to go back to the, the first one, we're talking about building on a budget. So really the goal is for us to get involved early on with the design. So as soon as, you know, I really think we go back to another episode, I really think a builder and architect have to be brought in at equal times. It could be, you know, one before the other, but they should be brought in very soon uh, after one another because you don't want the design getting too far down the line if we're not aligning on budget and not aligning on constructability. Um, we're also preparing preliminary estimates for each phase of the work as the information becomes available. So basically, as design do documents are being done, we're doing a design document budget. As we're 50% uh, CD or 50% construction documents, we're doing a 50% CD set of uh, 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 budget, uh, and then so on and so forth. Um, provide value engineering input. So this is when we're you know pricing things and say we have a set budget, and you know, we are, we're, we're combing through and realizing, man, like they're, they're designing a really complex HVAC system. But, you know, I spoke to my HVAC contractor and he said it was complex and it was really unnecessary. And he came in with an option that was option B saving them 50%. We're going to put that in another column and say, Hey, like you're, you're asking for, you know, $150,000, uh, HVAC system, but you know, here's a $75,000 option that would do just what you're asking. And, you know, it, we, we believe that it was over engineered or, you know, hey, you were looking for, I don't know, maybe the specs called for, you know, um, gosh, I don't, a $200 a square foot tile, which I feel like we recently had that as an allowance. And, and it's like, I mean, that's a pretty high per square foot tile allowance. I, we've certainly done it before, but is that really necessary? Like, where is that $200 coming from? Can we, you know, realistically be $20 a square foot and, and save you 10 X? Um, you know, there, there's always, there's, op there's always opportunities and we need to be as the builder providing feedback on what we can do from a value engineering standpoint. Um, and shout out to Ryan Pinkham because we talk about the word value engineering and how it's, uh, we need a better word for it because value engineering almost is, is like diminishing the the benefit of it and making it sound like you're using a lesser quality product, which you're not. It's, you know, I really think that what it comes down to is, you know, being thoughtful with material selection and being really diligent with your design process. Um, evaluate market conditions and schedule big calls to obtain the most competitive pricing. You know, it doesn't mean competitive necessarily in the sense like plumber to plumber, electrician to electrician. It's about being competitive in the sense that, you know, are we pricing the project accurately or are we working with a, a, a sub that's too busy to provide us pricing and how do we w help make their job easier? You know, I have guys that, you know, if we're doing siding, it's like, listen, I'll give you a price per square. I just don't have the time to do a takeoff. No problem. We'll run it through our takeoff software. This project's got 36 square, you know, here, here's a price per square. Is there any, anything else I should consider? Yeah. You know, carry this much for adding a, 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 a 
a, a home slicker behind the shingles. Or if you have woven corners, we typically charge X amount per linear foot of woven corners. We're going to help do this back and forth and make sure that we're, we're setting the, the, our sub up for success, but we're also getting the most accurate, competitive, in this case, uh, pricing for our, for our client. We're also going to prepare a preliminary schedule, and that's after we get through kind of this, the definition of scope, definition of pricing, and then we're going to start building out a preliminary schedule, and we try to do that in big blocks. So it's like, hey, this is how much time we need for site work, foundation, frame, or rough, you know, rough mechanicals, and so on and so forth, and as that project becomes, you know, more reality, then we're going to kind of take those big blocks of time and divide them up into a bunch of little tasks. You know, that's something that we've spent an enormous amount of time this last year is really digging into our schedule. And, you know, build a trend has been enormously helpful for that. Um, Brian and our, Brian on our team has really went headfirst into how to, to maximize the schedule. We've talked about that. Uh, I did an IGTV um, video, if you guys want to check that out, talking about the schedule process, walking through, you know, the, the steps that we take setting up a schedule and how they're linked to to-dos and automatic notifications and emails and so on and so forth. Um, uh, update and revise the approved master schedule as necessary. So again, we're talking about this back and forth, like as the design unfolds and gets more accurate, the budget becomes more accurate and the schedule becomes more accurate. Um, and then we're going to monitor uh, progress on both the design and pre-construction activities. Uh, and that's really just, you know, working with the architect, working with the homeowner, setting expectation. Everything's about expectation and communication. That's what it comes down to in this industry. And we want to make sure that if we're targeting a delivery date on a budget, I'm sitting here thinking about the fact that I have a budget due in two days because I had set that as a target. So after this, I, I know I got work to do. Um, but delivering on that, if you're going to communicate something, deliver on it. And then also work with the architect. Make sure that they're delivering on time. But not just like holding their feet to the fire, but is there something you need from us as the builder? Are you are you waiting on us to give? Are we do we need to provide pricing before you continue with the interior? You know, design. I'm working on a project right now. We're working on a project right now, where they're into interior design and they're waiting on us to put together like some preliminary pricing on it. And it's because we've kind of chosen a direction, but we we need we're we're at that crossroad of. I know we made it pretty simple from the aesthetic standpoint, but where are we tipping the scale are we tipping the scale where it's super simple that it's easier to execute or is it super simple but really expensive so that's where we're at with that um group two is going back to provide constructability review so you know work sequence relationships period of performance that's where we're going to get feedback from our trades so building out those schedules isn't just looking at historic data it's talking to our trades and figuring out hey what are you know what what do you need for rough you know here's a six thousand square foot house five bedroom a kitchen you know we will will be tying into a septic system we have a mechanical you know how much time do you need for rough and beyond that you know it do you need uninterrupted space painters for example how much time do you need to paint this house hey i need you know four weeks to do this but that means four weeks with no one else in the house so i can have the whole house okay well what if i can't give you the whole house well then it's eight weeks so having these conversations um, lead times for material and, and, and equipment procurement. That is so difficult right now. And it's the biggest pain point. You know, I just had a meeting with uh, my site guy literally uh, right before this podcast. And we were talking about how, you know, the, there's clients that he's dealing with where it's like, I'll pay double, I'll pay triple, I'll pay quadruple the price, just get the material here. And it's just not the case. Like in the times that we're facing right now, you know, it, the, it's not that the product exists and we can't get it here. It's that the product doesn't exist or, you know, a factory is shut down and they don't have people producing it, especially when you get into the high end items when they're not built, you know, they're not making these, you know, by the hundreds, they're making them by order. And when there's reduced staff and you're only producing X amount of, you know, pieces per day, that becomes incredibly difficult. Um, job site descriptions and, and depiction of conditions. So it's really, you know, looking at the, the, the drawings and the details and making sure that they're accu accurately, you know, um, communicated on the drawing, you know, reflecting back and reviewing that with your team and making sure that the details are detailed enough where you can build it, build from it. Because, you know, the, the more detailed the drawing is doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It needs to be easily understood as to understanding the outcome. And that's oftentimes why you get these verifying field notes or, you know, contractor to, you know, um, use best judgment or there's always, there's, 
there's always the heart like it's when you're looking at dimensions right you know dimensions are working from usually one wall and then leaving the last portion verify in field or just you know blank because it's more important that you work from this wall and then on this wall you can you can kind of adjust it like cabinetry you know they end up saying you know a three plus minus filler and that's because you know there's going to be a possible discrepancy um you know site restrictions uh access work areas disposal sites that's something that you know especially in, in you know any any project we're, we're talking about boston when we're doing a lot of renovations you know what's site access like is how's parking is it in beacon hill and if you guys are listening and, and know beacon hill you know parking is going to be a bear and you're going to spend you know a couple thousand bucks a month in parking tickets or you know maybe it might make sense to add a parking budget to have your guys park at the parking garage over at the common um you know really understanding the site access the constraints can i deliver all my material or am i breaking my material deliveries up does my lumber yard charge me a delivery fee if i can't get everything in once how many deliveries do i think i'm going to get and then times that by your delivery fee um you know utility connections obviously you know that's a, that's that's a huge thing we're, we're dealing with uh, utility contractors that are backlogged. So, you know, what about gas? Can we get gas in the property? How long are they out? Are we are we scheduling them with enough enough in advance? It's again, you know, we're talking about uh, the the difficulties about working on a job site, and are we you know are we putting things in place to make sure that we're uh, ahead of the 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 curve there? Um, also consideration of when we're starting the project. You know, weather related. You know, here in New England, we we can have good winters we can have terrible winters you know when are we starting that project at what point are we at when it's the dead of winter you know and if we have a really bad winter is that going to delay things or are we going to run into issues with damage you know are we going to have a situation where the the shell of the home is open to the elements and then gets damaged and then in springtime when it thaws out we're dealing with walls that are kind of all over the place you know those are the considerations and we have to make sure we're communicating to it uh communicating about it you know, second page here is just really our, our, our signature page. Um, can you can you see any of this? All right. Um, you know, to to kind of read what I have here. Um, I leave it. Yeah, I leave. So I leave an area under all that. That's our deliverables under that I, specific to this ag agreement for the project located at address. This is what we're doing. We are building a new single family home with the architect blah 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 and just giving us you know a quick outline of what the brief description is we're expected to start construction blah 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 with a projected uh target uh con schedule of 12 months um etc cetera, etc cetera. we also talk about target construction budget and the reason we put that on and this changes you know but we want a target listed on here because we want to have something to work towards i've talked about this before i'll talk about it again in that spreadsheet where we're, we're going to start pricing things out if our target budget's a million dollars and we're at 1.2 1.5 you know we're going to still run that out and figure out where this job really costs but then we might add that second column of here's how you get to a million and then we and, and we might look at that and say man that takes out a lot of scope we're, we've reduced 30 percent well what about if we were at 1.2 right in between well that actually gets you really close it gets you to 95 percent of what they want and they might look at that and say all right here's a good better best scenario and here's you know and we're communicating what what that looks like so they can make an educated decision um then we get into our fee so for us i'm just going to break it down where rather than a dollar amount you guys can use a dollar amount look at what your time is worth what your time is worth per hour and then figure how many hours that you probably are going to spend on something like this so for us you know we typically set a target of how many hours that we're going to spend on pre-construction uh, in this case we are averaging somewhere around 250 hours so we're going to times that by what our hourly rate might be in the office and we're going to hold that as our retainer uh, the retainer is non-refundable um, obviously there's human scenarios where we decide to give it back because we didn't perform at our best or people have uh, situations where you know at, at, you know right after they sign it they decide you know I don't want to do this project but in, in contractual language it is non-refundable because we are going to put the work in immediately following the signature uh, that ends up on the bottom here and then if we're gonna go over those hours we're gonna communicate that saying hey we've spent the hours that we've allocated to this job and at this point we, we need to start tracking our time and start billing per hour very very rarely does that happen um, 
but it does and it's usually when the design process is taking you know longer and we are just not making as much progress as we thought maybe maybe because the client's indecisive or we're up against different challenges that we were didn't know but again we're communicating it we're we're explaining why you know this process is taking longer and if we don't have a, a commitment to build the project then we're going to switch to a time and material basis uh, primarily time and make sure that we're tracking logging and then billing those hours um, and then at the bottom we have a signature uh, and it gets kicked back over to us. So not sponsored in any way, uh, but we are using PandaDoc, um, which is great. You can use DocuSign. Uh, there's a ton of digital document signature platforms. Adobe, uh, you can actually request signatures right in there and it verifies the signature. It's all legal binding. Well, again, not legal advice, but my understanding is legally binding, uh, but we make it super easy. So when we meet with a potential client and they want a pre-construction agreement, we'll, we'll get in there, we'll fill out their information. All of this is boilerplate. We'll kick that email over to them. They can log in, sign, and once that's signed, it kicks over to accounting and says, hey, we have a new pre-construction agreement. Build them that retainer and let the project management team know that we have another project to start working on. Guys, we appreciate you listening. We'll see you guys next week. 